Rome is often referred to as the city of seven. <laughs> seven hills, man. Did y'all know that? <laughs> what are some of the alternative names for Rome? I was just thinking out loud. Left to the con. My chicken. Due to its geographical location and also as the eternal city. Kind of sounds like Jerusalem. You know, it kind of sounds like Quiver. Seven cities like what, man? The city of the seven? Seven hills? Did y'all know? Did y'all know? There's a lot of cities of Rome correlated with America. It just seems to be this Rome-Jerusalem connection. Almost like with the Flavius Josephus flow, one is borrowing from the other or they're both the same damn thing. As we've been digging on and getting with the Kalelu's drop, you know, the Ramani, the Ramani in Hebrew is the pomegranate, which leads you to the connection of the promised land. The Ramani is also uh, famous city of Jerusalem, the Ramah. Or are we just talking Rome, boss? Did they turn the Ramah, Ramah into the Roma? Good question. Because we know uh, Black King Charles is the Holy Roman Emperor, right? And you know, <laughs> Black Charles and them. All you gotta, all you gotta do is put in Black Charles. <laughs> you know, Holy Roman, right? Oh, we talking Germany? <laughs> we talking Habsburgs? We talking dog heads? <laughs> Some more and more war. This is Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. I can't make this up. So when I say wrong, don't let them iconoclast brainwash you and mind blast you into thinking any other than Swarth Charles. When I say German, like we got in the last drop, we talking swarthy, according to Benjamin Franklin, 1751, because just a couple of hundred years early, 1500 still had a black royal <laughs> Roman emperor. Hijacking the Inca flow. Conquering American Nagas. Some more and more war. Everybody else got in later, boss. <laughs> For the most part, you know, all these other, you know, hijacks just got in, man, uh, where they could fit in, man. They were promised titles. They were promised gold to come over here and help. The invasion, they just wanted numbers. They just wanted bodies on bodies, boss. So when I say Roman, I want you to remember Swarthy Charles. Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Don't you think of no other image when I say Roman? <laughs> In terms of the hijack. Now when I say Romani, well now we're talking... Nog is connected with the promised land, not trying to hijack it. He took the title because he wants to hijack the Ramon, the pomegranate, the pomegranate, the pomegranate, the pomegranate. We just saying Ramon. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up, boss. The Ramon is the Roman, boss. Look how they put the R-U in, the room in, the rum. Ooh, the rum. So you could do R-I, Managa. <laughs> oh, not to be confused with Rema. All right, let's just go there because they don't want us to be confused. So it must, it must mean <laughs> there's something to confuse ourselves on, right? All 
are. So these are just people's names. Of course, they're named after the promised land. The Roman is the Ramah. Yeah, they connected with Israeli this, Israel that, right? Because the Ramah connects you directly with Israel, boss. Don't be confused. Or you better back, back and give us 50 feet. We're here for the con, not the confusion. But sometimes the cons need the fusion. And when the fusion meets the cons, you know, <laughs> when the fuse is ignited, it meets the con, it meets the priest, it meets, you know, the, the, the kundalini, the kundalini, it meets that dragon, your soul, the, the vessel in which your soul is contained, the unknown substance. When that fusion reaches that un unknown substance, boy, boy, you got to remind, you got to remind. Because they say remind could also, also mean grenade, like a detonation, like a spark, like it igniting. Something's igniting when you talk remind, when you talk ruma. Yeah, can it also talk grenade? I'm just remind, right? <laughs> Hebrew. How about grenade? How about grenade? <laughs> yeah, yeah, boss. Hand grenades, Remanim in Hebrew. I'm out of here, boss. We out of here, boss. <laughs> I don't know, just, let's start right here. So when we say Pama granite or granate, it's also referring to this ignition. <laughs> say it with me, boss. Ignition. <laughs> Flat Drop 101. Named after the fruit since their explosion is reminiscent of a burst of its many seeds. The pomegranate has an explosion that's reminiscent of the burst of its many seeds. Monaga, the Remani, the Rome, the promised land, has a burst that is an explosion when it's ignited. You, Monaga, are an explosion to these hijacks. When you're ignited, it is reminiscent of the burst of your many seeds, my God. Do you see clearly? I'm talking about the crown. Ooh, Khaled, come on, man. Come on, boss. And we way ahead of the game. Forbidden histories of America. Daniel Lowe told us about this Cali, right? I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm out of here. You see how Israel the third connects to the Toltec, connects to the Mexica. You see how the name America connects to the Amarik or the Makir. Manani. Grandfather of Tapu Zain, who's Israel the seventh, priest of Quetzalcoatl. You see how the Joshua flow connects to the Quetzalcoatl. Both lead you to the promised land. The Quetzal is the rainbow bird and the cloud forest, the, the high level dragon, the Quetzalcoatl, the dragon. The rainbow dragon, my night. But why should I put that bow in the sky? As a sign, right? Who left Kalula for Rhoda. <sighs> Remember Rhoda. Right now, we're talking Kaliks. <laughs> Cali. <laughs> Remember Rhoda. Right now, we're just talking Cali. Say it with me, boss. I knew I saw this spelled this way before, and I already had this doc up because I already knew it was going to need it. Lawa. In an article, it tells of Kalelus, meaning promised land. So when we talk Kalelus, we're just talking promised land. Where, boss? Where? Promised land in a sense, in one sense, and or Kali with an X at the end, right? Kali X, right? Kali X. 
Halik X, which is the land of America. So we're talking a kingdom that was found here. That is promised land. That is Kale, Kale loose or Kali with an X, right? Where else did we see that? Like when you realize that you are already home, and you know it's all happening. You know it's all happening. We know it's all happening because we got a grenade, <laughs> you know, of information, a grenade of spirit, a pomegranate. Where's Granada balls? Remani. In Hebrew, named after the fruit since the explosion is reminiscent of the burst of as many seeds. At the edge of its red or yellow husk, it is Kali or crown, which is the remnant of the blossom. We're learning from the fruit <laughs> that we are already home. We're learning from the fruit that this is America, Managa. Because the Kali is the crown. Is the Rimani. Is the Roman. So whoever got the Rimani, Managa, got the explosion, right? Got the seeds, many seeds. Got the Kali. Got the crown. This is why Black King Charles wanted the crown or the title of Ramani. Let's take it slow, man. <laughs> Let's take it slow. We're talking Cali. Whoever got the Ramah got the crown. Whoever got the promised land, the Cali with an X got the crown. And so again, when we talk Ramah and Rome, talking America, we're talking cities of gold. Talking crown shit. Crown jewels. Promised land. Cali. Which is the pomegranate. <laughs> which is the grenade, right? Which is the granata. So I said, call us the pomegranagas. <laughs> We the Pomegranaga Nagas, you know what I'm saying? Which is the Raman, which is the Roman, right? We are Rome. Because Rome is promised land. Is Kalelus, is Cibola, is Cali. Kalelus records speak of Theodorus as the leader of many peoples who leave the Roman lands for Kalelus 775 AD. Now, it's interesting because, you know, they're not talking Rome, Romani, you know, what they're talking about, Rome is the the duplicate Rome. We're about to get into phantoms and duplications and Fermenko, Managa, you're right on time. Get cozy. Welcome to the 140th installment of your Presta Priest King Khan <laughs> investigation. Shut up. America, my kid, Nehemiah, it's already here, cause this is 775 AD, now, you know, 
regards to hijacked timelines, this could be 1775. Like, you know, a thousand years be added, taken away, but, you know, Kaleu's records speak of Theodore Roos. Again, the Roos or the truth. The Roos is Russia, Russia. The Roos is the Anne Roos, right? These are the Naga clans that connect to Promised Land. As the leader of many peoples who leave the Roman lands for Kalelus, which are the real Romani, in 775, so he comes back home because he, he already is from the bloodline of the Ibaru right here. Now, this is a David on David, or, you know, after the days of Solomon, you know, the kingdom is divided. They're fighting for promised land within Israel. This is an Israelite situation when you talk about Romans and Franks and France. Because the Franks were part and parcel with the Rus. And the Rus are all connected with the kings and queens of Jerusalem and, and Judah. Manaya. So these are your titles. These are not slave names. This is your house. Rus, Rus. All this is connected. Land of Rus. Kiev and, and Rus. Clan Seol Andreas. With wisdom, Managa. We can conquer our fortune. In gold, we have our inheritance. So Theodore Roos is none other than the Jewish king of Septimania or the Hebrew Khan of the seven cities. Now, Sept means seven. And where do we just get that? This, did you know? <laughs> That's as Roman means. You hear Roman, man, think swarthy, man. Rome is often referred to as the city of seven years. This is where they hide in this. Also the eternal city. All right, but now we can see clearly. We're just talking. <laughs> Remind me, Kalelus. So he's the king of Septimania, a Roman Jewish state in southern France. So this is a connection of the Romani here over there. The Presta is the emperor of the three Indies. It's all happening. It's all this Asia and that Asia are connected. We got to get it through our mind bowls that we're talking about one connected land. Straits of Antioch. Ancient lands, man. So this Romani Hebrew state in south where the franks be it could easily also be canada <laughs> you know what i'm saying he is the son of the first hebrew king of septimania again seven cities ago also called theodoric theodori theory amary de Nor norban makir chodros theodorus right so repetition breaks the spell because this is all you know coded you know it's been you know hidden in front of your own eyes the whole time and when you fact check this and connect this with real history this you know timelines or chronologies and you see this stuff man <laughs> ain't no play play this is you because nobody can claim it because the jewish were just converting in the eighth century they didn't have no kingdom of kalelus popping off and and these warrior kings was <laughs> fighting head up, you know, armies, you know what I mean? Like, you don't know them for that, holding these swords like that, <laughs> going to war like that, not, not like this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This was biblical type stuff right here. They admit to being, you know, converts whenever people convert to things, you know. It's all good. People convert to something every day. No one's upset that you converted. You know, we just say, you know, we're here to take our identity, to walk in our shoes, to stand on it. And it starts with the code in our ball. We search for Hawa and King David. And it's leading us into a priest king, a, a prester, a chief, right? Amor, Ben Amor also known as Theodore, king of Saxony, and as Namus, duke of Bavaria. He and his brothers were great warrior 
David, right? The Vedic princes of the time of Charlemagne. On the death of his father, Machir Theodoric, in about 765 AD, Nehemiah Theodoric becomes the Western Exilarch and leader of all the Hebrews of the revived Western Remani Empire of Charlemagne. Don't worry, I'm going to break it down for you. We're going to get hijacked free. Because we see clearly. When they say Jew, we know they didn't convert yet. So who can claim your, who can walk in your shoes, cause? No one. That's why they hide this. This is why this book is called The Forbidden, The Forbidden Histories of America. 775, Nehemiah, Theodori, reconquered the American Empire of Kalelus. The American Empire of Kalelus. Don't tell me this ain't nothing other than the American empire or kingdom of the promised land which is why Kaledus was ruled by solomon the builder called sylvanus told texas shout out to my texas cop the hereditary ruler of this former hebrew ruled rima promised land pomegranate and august colony i got y'all we're going to decode this <laughs> in naga naga talk man it's 140. We out of here. I'm not slowing down for no IJ. You want me to slow down? Yeah, then, then, uh, you know, go uh, chop and screw. You know, chop and screw this up, man. Shout out. Rest in power, DJ Screw. Man. <laughs> Shout out to my H-Town Nuggets, man. Chop and screw this, man, if you want to slow it down. I ain't doing it, man. <laughs> Yo, Seth pop off, man. Yo, Seth the real. Go dig on the con. Yo, Seth the real. Can't wait till the Eat the Squad is popping off so you can get a steady dose of the con and the toe kev, but not that the con's put so much work and dedication in the coding, man. You know, the the guts and the trenches of Hijack City, man. It, it, it's it's a messy job sometimes, but yo, Seth, man, <laughs> he gets suited up, man, and he goes in there for us and gets the drop for the cons no matter what it takes. And, hey, uh, man, a masterful job with the Caesar's Messiah. Uh, exploiting and showing, man, the the uh, phantoms, the duplications, the hijack, the timelines, like the con did so well, man. So, look forward to the continuation. Hey, out to all the cons and the Ether Squad. Eye. Make sure you download the app four three two to drop radio. Let's go. Kalelus was founded in the first century BC by the Babylonian Exilarch. All right, we've been talking Ashlark, known as Sylvanus, Ogam or Sylvanus, Bravo, S Solomon II, Babylonian Exilarch, Nazi of Mara, ruler of Sumer, Sumer set in Britain, all swarthy, a great Remani Hebrew ruler, soldier and ancestor of the Swan Knights, the Barbar, mean swan in Hebrew, Barbary, Barbar, Barbar, all this is swan in Hebrew. Swan Knights, right? And that's right under the Exilarch or the leader or the chief or the priest Khan Sylvanus, which is Solomon. And back to the Soli titles, you know, that we saw with uh, in the GD.com flow. You know, the Soli, this, even Preston John was called a Soli. So this Bravo or Ogon predates Totexas, who is Solomon the Builder. So we said, is this another title for a David? Bravo. Bravo is also Barbar. So they're saying he's the Khan of the Swans, man. The Swan Khan. Jenny.com, remember the Raja Raja, right? Raja Raj. Uh, Presto John. Why is he showing up in the genealogies if he's just a mythology boss? And why is he the emperor of Soli? <laughs> and the Chola is the Soli. Soli is Chola. Chola is Soli. So when we recon the Chola dynasties, the Panians, and we start getting into that India flow, you know what I mean? It's the same history as this Chinese Mongol flow. It's the same history as this Native American Kalelus flow. Who's more Native American than Nagas Papadoff in 775 with a full empire 
of Kalalos, who's more Native American than Solomon Sylvanus Totaxis, who pops off the toll tax, my God. Predecessor of Kitsukwal. See how this Native American history connects with the Indian flow. Roger here, Roger flow is still pressed to child. Whose son is David, Sauson of Babylon, who's the Axelar. And he has a son, Solomon the First, solely. Okay. Slow down, drop you dropping too fast. Sit my tea as I go. Welcome back to the Presta Show. <laughs> Sit my tea as I go. Welcome back to the Presta Show. Yeah, he's a son Solomon, a show, a son Hanan, a son Dawi. And these are the Solis. So what I'm saying, we see Solomon, and then you see Sylvanus Bravo. You know what I'm saying? All these are Solis. So the Solomon the second. Even though Bravo predates Sylvanus to Texas, he's still Solomon the second. He's still a Soli or a Chola. So you can go into the Indian flow, to the Mongol flow, China flow, Native American flow. And you're like, damn, is this all the same history? The Roman flow too? So y'all took our history and took it for yourselves and put it in your own mythologies and created gods and deities and so who are you? Like that's the that's the that's the sixty four million dollar question. Like my pops would say, rest in power, Michael Andrews. Man, he would say the sixty four million dollar question. Uh, who is you, boss? <laughs> who is y'all? If the Roman history is really the Israelite history, the real Roman history is really the Israelite history. Then when they hijack. And these swarthy nagas, <laughs> you know, they know what they was doing. Hiding in our tents, right? And how would they? How could they create all this other Roman history? You know how? By adding a thousand years to your timeline. That's how Scalic and Batavius done pushed your time back. <laughs> Let me back it up. So the Cali, the Cali is the crown, is the Rima, is the title that they push for Roma. And the Cali, according to Daniel Lowe, in the Forbidden Histories of America, is the empire of Kalalus, the American empire. Which means promised land. Or Cali. <laughs> so the Cali is the Cali. And why they spell it that way, I don't know, but it's mighty interesting that the pomegranate, the word for pomegranate, which is Ramah, which is where they're getting the Rome, <laughs> or the Rome in. And then, you know, Moses sent Joshua and Caleb to collect the pomegranates to prove that they're in the promised land. Which is proving that we're just talking the land of America. Pomegranate, pomegranagas, and all this history catching up to where we're at in 765, 775 predates any of history they're gonna give us in school about anything it predates these dark ages <laughs> and it's all happening in America yeah. the Irish Regamon now I don't know why again well <laughs> I guess we know why why Daniel Lowe leaves out the last sentence 
in another text, he had this sentence in here, right? And in this text, he takes this important sentence out of the equation. But love to Michael Rory, he still has the original. <laughs> he has this last sentence still here. As we talk Kalelus, right? Which means promise land. And we talk these objects, right? These, <laughs> we've been talking it for a long time, uh, you know, live on the radio, 432 to drop, man, TDR, man. So, you know, we've been reading the Cyclone Covey book, Kalelus, you know, digging on, uh, you know, these swords, these artifacts that have Hebrew writing on them. Has Latin, has Hebrew, but like sophisticated ancient Hebrew, my dog. So we're just talking Judah, remember? <laughs> this Davidic war with these Davidic gods. And it just appears that all this was covered up by the Smithsonian and all these other folks because they, them today, they can't claim this stuff. First, they kind of put something out in 1927, New York Times. Oh, uh, a Jewish state of America, a Jewish state found in America. But then they realize that all that connects them with the Toltecs, and they can't claim to be the Toltecs, so they better stop trying. But you, my naga, who they call black, <laughs> color, you, copper color con, can definitely claim to be the Toltec, right? and can claim these swords and in Hebrew, wield these swords. We're talking about the Americans, copper color races found here in the promised land. Now here's the line they took out. We just read it over there. All right, the legend of Ogier the Dane, son of Godfrey, Kadro, doing in my hands, refers to Tuatha de Danan, Dunan, who also known as Menanan, Maine of America, right? We got that. But look at all this that they took off, right? <laughs> Where the giant ogre heads of the Almex are found. The Irish legend Regamon also looted his family. So now we got a face. We got the Almec that they turned into giant ogres in mythology and cartoons, right? So the ogres our derogatory form of the army, kind of like the Kafar al Tarak. You know, they said, oh, they had no noses. They were just some uh, mutants. But really, you're just talking about like the tribe of Reuben and Simeon. You know what I'm saying? And in the Almex, they turned into ogre heads. The giant heads of the Almec are found in Manane. Now, Mananan is also in the four corners. Mananan and Rhoda are on the maps near Arizona or within that Arizona, Utah, Judah, Utah flow. Now, why, why, why do you think they took off this part of the line and left us with what he left us with, right? Maine of America. Tuatha, right, the Ogier, blah, blah, blah. But the Ogier is the Ogre, now that we know. Man and the man of America. He left us and put a period right here and talked about Regamon, also alluding to this family. And then it goes on, right? But here, there is no period, and it says where the giant Ogre heads of the Almec are found. So now we can connect the Almec with. The Bravo, Sylvanus, and then the Salimans, the Israelites, the She Shia, Western Shia, who Genghis Khan with the war with the Shia, Shia in the Mongol flow. And you wonder what happened to the Shia Almec, right? The XI, right? So the XI, the XIA are the same. In the Mongol flow, you got the XIA, Western Shia, that Genghis Khan is going to war with. But the Almecs are also known as the Shi, the XI, or XIA. So this is the same cons, man. And they had to go head up with Genghis Khan, which means that they was rocking with the Preston, or the Salimah, or the Soli, 
right? Or the solid. Or the presta. Let's go. So they took out the ogre almec flow. <laughs> you see what well, we gotta do the recon. And Israel the third went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico and his grandson Makir Amarik. So Israel the third. Let me tell you why this is important. No. Okay, let me go here first. Then I'm gonna go back. All right, Israel the third went to the Toltec lands of Mexico. And his grandson Makir Amarik. Alright, Mexico Odom. So you know get the codexes, the Mexico Autumn. Is Makir is America America Israel the third went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico and his grandson Makir. Now, if these were some Caucasian, <laughs> you think they just rocking south to the Toltec lands, just all cool and breezy like that? And his grandson Makir and Madrid, that means that they can now claim to be the Amarik, right? The Mixquat of the Toltecs. They can claim to be the Toltecs. If they claim to be Israel the third, they can also claim to be Native Americans, right? And that don't jive with their story because they don't claim that type of genocide. They claim their own genocide. But the Native American genocide <laughs> is the Hebrew genocide, the Toltec. Genocide is Israel's genocide. Let's talk Rhoda. <laughs> was the grandfather of Tapuzin, who was called Israel the seventh priest of Gitzquad. So Israel the seventh is the priest of Joshua. Which is interesting, you know, interesting to go back in the script in the scriptures with a Dragonfly perspective and say, now who was the priest of Joshua? I don't know. I don't know if they'll have a definitive answer for who is the priest of Joshua in the Bible. They're calling Joshua the high priest. Ooh. Joshua the first priest. Ah. <laughs> the Kai. Also Yeshua. Yeshua, right? Like Jesus, boss? No, we're talking Joshua. <laughs> but it's the OG Yeshua. Hawa saves or Hawashua. Foreshadowing JC. See? See? Got him. Phantoms, Yosef. Okay, now he foreshadowed. Man, this gets quiet. He leads the people to the promised land. He's fighting giants for you. That JC didn't fight no giants. Didn't lead you nowhere. <laughs> didn't free the people at all. Y'all tripping, man. This is the OG, right? He's the son of Joseph Doc. Okay, Jeshua, uh -huh. I'm just, you know, breezing, I'm just breezing. So when you say, you know, priest, you know, they're calling him high priest, that's interesting. Grandson of Sariah. Okay, I mean, we got some work to do. We got some work to do. This is an investigation, my life. We put our story, our live, our frequency back together. Because what we observe today connects to our ancestors directly, man. Immediately, my life. So this priest of Quetzalcoatl left Cholula for Rhoda. In about a thousand AD. Now, do we have any maps 
of Rhoda the Digger. You know, Rhoda also became Rodrigo, my nigga. So when you see Rodrigo, it's still Rhoda. It's still American, my nigga. It's still American. <laughs> Check it. He joined the remnant of the Rodans who left who he led east and back to Europe and some of the Latin Jewish or the Hebrew Rodas settled in Northwest Spain. Now you can connect this 1492. Uh, the Moors are expelled out of Spain. Ah, these were <laughs> the, the Muans were expelled. You know what I'm saying? The, the Hebrews were expelled. These are the same Hebrews, not, not the Moabites, cause <laughs> the Hebrew, the, Jacob was expelled. Judah was expelled out of Spain. Because these were the Judah, not Jewish, Judah, Rodas. And where are they from, boss? God, uh, I got to go to the Discord for this, man. Shout out to Count 2 Tick Rick. Dropping lots of maps in here. Ty Tybet, Tybezon, man. She, she got a whole campground. Of drop going on. <laughs> Go get cozy. Put your cozy slippers on. Man, my, my naga too tick. And this is the map drop category, man. It's a map drop. He, he dropping the uh, El Dorado joints. Uh, Orinoco flow. Moreau, Moreau. Like, yeah, I see you, God. I see you, God. Yeah, Atlantic Ocean. Man, that's connected with the cities of gold, though, if y'all don't know, man. I mean, we get mapped. You just notice. You're going to see some maps unlike any you've ever seen before. <coughs> Let's get it. Oh, look at Australia's, man. <laughs> Don't say that article, boss. It says Australia's. Look how big it is, boss. <laughs> yeah. Now they just act like it's a little blob on the bottom of a ball, right? Come on, boss. There's a lot to know about that article. No cap on an article's chest bone. No ice. Man, nothing but the drop happening. Hyperborean, man. Remember that? Hyperborean map? We're going to pull the Hyperborean map, man. We're going to talk some stuff. Remember the Hyber is the Kyber is the Kyber is the Copper is the Heber or the Eber. Ebor. Eboru. The Eboru seems to have a connection <laughs> with the center of things. Hyperborean has everything to do with the Kyber, Heber, Eber. My naga. Yeah. Hi, Bernie. Hi, Bernie. Okay. My naga's getting mappy for real. Hey, how to tick Rick, man. It's nothing but the drop. I'm going to take my time with it, man. Don't even trip. Don't even trip. Hey, look how that Arnica <laughs> wants to go all the way around, huh, man? Go ahead, two tick. Something I dropped a minute ago, man. This is uh, Rhoda, man. This is Rhoda, man. And this Rhoda is right there in the heart ball of, you know, Arizona. It was a little blurry here. There we go. There we go. So you got Tucson, like Tucson, Arizona right there. Gila River. Texas Canyon. So when we talk Rhoda, my night, we're talking right in a hard ball, right? The Tucson artifacts were found right there. This is where the Tucson artifacts. We're about to get more into that. So we talk Rhoda and the Rodents and Rodrigo and Rodriguez. And we talking red. We talking Rhoda, my life, right? <laughs> we talking Red River, Red Sea. You talking Arizona. You talking America. You talking Kalelu. Let's put it together, boss. 
these rodents are Hebrews of America. This is the land, the kingdom, the empire of America. We're talking Kalei Luz. We're talking Pastor John, Soli, Soliman. We're talking the remnant. And we're talking 1000 AD that this Israel the seventh priest of Kitsukawadu left Cholula for Rhoda. So he left Cholula for Rhoda, Arizona. <laughs> Repetition breaks the spell. Uh, where is Cholula? How you spell it? Cholula? Mexico, okay. Cholula. Pueblo, Mexico. Cholula Pueblo. Best known for his great pyramid. Man, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. What? <laughs> my nigga's like, yeah, man, we've been popping off on this pyramid. I know my nigga's just, you know, I feel like I'm hearing it for the first time. We connecting things, you know, we just coming back clear the house at this point. The Great Pyramid of Cholula, also known as, man, you tell me, but I do see a Hawa right there. I do see H-U-A, which is Hawa, and that's how they would do it in the native flow, or Nuh nu, na Hawato. H-U-A, Hawa is everywhere. Hawa is everywhere. For constructed mountain, a complex located in Cholula, Pueblo, Mexico, largest archaeological site of the pyramid temple in the world. This is the largest archaeological site of a pyramid in the world, boss. In the world, Craig. The whole world. This is the largest pyramid. This must be the old world. They had to like this is the old world, boss. They had to like this is Asia, boss. They acting like they just called this place North America, boss. They acting like the Gandhi's River has a connection <laughs> to the promised land. They acting like Cathay means pure land. Florida. <laughs> the real Perry, Paris. Okay. Okay. The pyramid is located in San Andreas, Cholula. Why not? San Andreas is what? St. Andrews. Andres, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Pueblo municipality marks the area in the center of the city where this municipality begins. The city is divided into two municipalities called San Andreas and San Pedro. Pedro. This division originates in the Toltec Kimeca or Kikimeca conquest of the city in the 12th century. 12th century. Again, we're talking press of John time. Genghis Khan time. All makes go to war with Genghis Khan. Remember the she? Huh? Remember the all make ogre? <laughs> Solomon connection. We just got it for being the histories of America. The Almeca, she, XI, Kalanka, to the south of the city. So these pushed the former dominant ethnicity of the Almeca, she, Kalana, Kalanka. I know I'm probably saying that way wrong, right? but you get it. To the south of the city. These people kept the pyramid as their primary religious center. But the newly dominant Toltec, Kikimekas, found a new temple to Quetzalcoatl, right? But we can now connect this with Israel, where the San Gabriel Monastery is now. The Toltec Kikimek people who settled in the area. How, how are we talking Toltecs? And we was just talking Toltecs. Because we look up Cholula, it has everything to do with the Toltecs, the biggest, largest pyramid in the world. Talak Ki, Talak Ki, Hawa, Letep. 
Atelier, <laughs> meaning artificial hill or damn pyramid, right? The name Jalula has its origin in the ancient Nahuatl word Kalalong, which means place of refuge. The adobe brick building stands 25 meters, 82 feet above the surrounding plain, which is significantly shorter than the Great Pyramid of Giza's height, 146.6 meters, 481 feet, but much wider, measuring 300 by 315 meters or 984 by 1,033 feet in its final form, compared to the Great Pyramid's base. Dimensions 230.3 and 230.3 meters, 756 by 756. The pyramid is a temple that tradition has been viewed as having been dedicated to the god Quetzalcoatl or Joshua, or is it a refuge? Digging on these dimensions, man. You know, it's all mathematical. It's all mathematical. So it's wider, way wider than the Great Pyramid of Giza, although the Great Pyramid of Giza is much taller, you know, but this is way bigger, way wider. So, yeah. And then when they start getting into the dating, man, in a lot of these pyramids, such as Cholula, um, you know, have dating way you know some would put it way before the great pyramid of Jesus so it's you know Tia Tia to Hawaii here goes another Hawaii how many Hawaii's you see H-U-A H-A-W-A Hawaii man this is a whole drop in itself this is beautiful Cholula So this Cholula Pueblo. So he left Cholula, right, in Mexico and went to Arizona. That's all they're just saying. Here in this Andres, you know, connects you back with the Bruce. Take on some architecture, man. Just imagine how beautiful Cholula. You know, they try to show you what it would have been or what it was, the sacred land, man. Now we can connect it with Israel. What are we talking? Meshiko. Meshi is Moshe, Moses, or Joshua, or Quetzalcoatl. <laughs> what did it say? You know, this was dedicated to Joshua, but you know you're in the land of Meshi. Meshiko. Joshua led the people to the promised land. But I, so if anything, it's honors, you know what I'm saying? But to them, it's worship. Oh, you're worshiping Joshua, or you honoring the God. Or is it a place of refuge? Like Solomon's temple, it's not the worship of Solomon. You know, Kitzkoado's temple. It's not the worship of uh, Quetzalcoatl or Joshua. You know, it's just these interpretations. You know, they're showing some mock layouts of it, man. But you just, you know, see how amazing. I mean, truly, truly amazing. This whole flow is, the architecture is, how it all comes together. Use your imagination. Use your imagination. Let's go. <laughs> World's largest pyramid, man. Mexico, not Egypt.
just the castle that's inside or the cathedral they built on top trying to suck the energy from and they put their JC right there, man. Or did they not build this and just repurpose it and turn it into a worship of JC? You know, but this is old, ancient, what they would call Moorish, you know what I'm saying? But we just know that, uh, you know, we were already popping off with the greatest. Shalula, okay. Okay, drop. You ain't dropping too fast. We right on time, boss. We know where Rhoda is, right? Arizona. So this priest of Kitsukawada, who is Israel the seventh, was in Cholula. God. And if Israel the seventh was in Cholula, <laughs> then Managi. So was Mitzkawada. So was Maki. So was Israel the third. Because he went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico. And now you got Cholula, right? So Israel III's grandson is Amarik or Makir or Mixquot. And he himself was the grandfather of the priest of Joshua or Kitsukawab. <laughs> So Makir is the grandfather of the priest of Kitsukwa. And it's interesting that they say the priest of Kitsukwa and not the name, right? Why would they leave that name out? Oh, there we go. Tip. <laughs> there we go. So let me slow down. <laughs> Drop it too fast. Tapo Z, who is Israel the seventh, is the priest of Kitsukwa. Bang. Thank you. Gotcha. Who left Cholula? So Tapo Zin or Israel the seventh left Cholula for Rhoda in about 1000 AD. He leaves Cholula, goes to Rhoda. Ancient road. You know, this is making sense, right? <laughs> Santa Cruz River cuts through this. There's Saint of the Cross, right? And all these crosses are found, which are swords, many of them. Some are just Hebrew tiles. They have Hebrew inscriptions on them. Found right here in Tucson, Rhoda. They call them the Tucson. Uh, crosses or you know these artifacts he rejoined the remnant of the rodents who he led east right back to Europe some of these rodents settled in Spain right where they were trained as warriors they were welcome um, they were welcomed in the fight to preserve the freedom of Northwest Spain from the Muslims. So who got expelled out of Spain? Because there seemed to be some beef between the tribe of Judah <laughs> and these Mohammedan tribes or Moabite tribes or Canaanite, whatever tribes. So who expelled who? Everyone was expelled together. <laughs> Damn. I ain't buying it. Because these Rodons were fighting against these Islam powers over there. And Rodrigo, Roda, right? El Cid. Look up El Cid. We got to do a whole drop on El Cid itself. Tapuzin's great grandson. Tapuzin's son was called Lying Calvo, who is Lancelot. So we compared this with the King Arthur's flow a lot. Lancelin is Lancelot. Kalelus is Camelot. King Arthur's Camelot is Kalelus. Lancelin is Lane Calvor. Lancelin, who is the son of Tapuzin. And Tapuzin is the priest of Quetzalcoatl. 
who leaves Cholula for Rhoda in Arizona. Rodrigo El Cid and his father Diego Lanis or Jacob Khan married into the Davidic Axelark family. So now he's connected with the Davids. You know, he's already Judah, but now he's in the David High Court family of Barcelona, which are still Nagas <laughs> and Este. His daughter Maria Rodriguez was the wife of Raymond Beringer, the fourth Arnold Count of Barcelona, descended in the male line from Gulbuli or Gul Abarik, Belan, Yakar, Ben, Judah. Bang! These were all the tribes of Judah, but I, whether we're talking Asia there or Asia here. Spain, France, <laughs> Nagas, Israel, more and more. Right, the youngest son of the Makir Tadros of Septimania, Lion Calvo, sister Shemin of Kalelus, Mary Fernand Nunez of the Counts of Amaya, Amaya family. We know we in America, right? Some genealogists have confused the ancestries of this family of the LC. Okay. So what are they fighting over? They're fighting over the promised land. Fighting over Cali. <laughs> the Pomegranate. Septimania, the seven cities ago. Kalelu. And here's some of these inscriptions found. All these artifacts in Arizona, my God. I mean, come on, boy. These are the little redrawings of them, but just imagine how beautiful they are. They got a dragon wrapping around it man these are definitely high you know uh, energetic connections man yeah, that's all i can say <laughs> high frequency drops and what they call crosses you might look at as a sword right <laughs> look at that they found this in arizona my life right <laughs> At first, you know, the Jewish community got excited. They said, well, this proves we have some American ties. And it's like, whoa, that would be to say that we are the Toltecs. And that's crazy. Let's back out of this before <laughs> we just look crazy to this people. Now we got to act like we got rolled up on by Columbus. <laughs> Cut it. Some also say that there was a little Hebrew and Greek found on them as well. Is that right? Roman Jewish crosses to Romani Hebrew colonies and leg crosses of Tucson, right? That's what we just showed on the road of map. So this is their interpretations of these inscriptions. It's not exactly this and that, but, you know. Britain, Albion, Jacob are on these swords and artifacts. Romans, Actim, Theodore, like Theodorus. Right? This is their translation. Right? So, Gaul, Sinai, Israel. On the vertical beam of one of the lead crosses is this inscription Councils of great cities together with 700 soldiers. A.D. 800, January the 1st, quote, We are born over the sea to Kalelus, an unknown land where Totexas, Sylvanus ruled far and wide over a people. Theodore transferred his troops to the foot of the city, Rhoda. So Theodore was right there in Arizona when we talk about forbidden histories of America. And more than 700 were captured. No gold is taken away. Theodore, a man of great courage, rules 14 years. Jacob rules for six. 
With the help of God, nothing has to be feared in the name of Israel. Arizona, cause 700, 800 AD. This ain't a part of their Native American history, boy. This ain't Native enough. Let's go. Second cross has the following inscription. Jacob renews the city. <laughs> with God's help, Jacob rules with mighty hand in the manner of his ancestors. Sing to the Lord, may his fame live forever. The dirt cross yielded this inscription from the egg, the beginning, A.D. 700 to 900 A.D. Nothing but the cross. While the war was waging, Israel died. Pray for the soul of Israel. May the earth lie light on thee. He adds glory to ancestral glory. Israel, defender of the faith. Israel reigns 67 years. Israel the second rules for six. Israel the third was 26 years old when he began to rule. Internecine war. To conquer or die. He flourishes in ancestral honor day by day. So this is what's in Arizona. And then you have the 1000 AD with Israel the seventh going from uh, Cholula to Tucson, Arizona. All right, then you got the Anasazi migration, you know, out the four corners between 900 and what, 1300. And now you got Tinoch Titlan popping off up to 1300. And then what, Monaga, then what? You got Genghis Khan's invasion in America, and then Columbus sells the ocean blue 1492. And then Nagas is expelled out of Spain 1452, right after the Papal Bull, or right exactly when the Papal Bull 1452 was popping off to get all you Hebrews and put you in perpetual slavery. So up in the 1300s, we straight, right? 1200s, you know, well, you still got the Genghis takeover in 1202. So between 1200, 1300, you know what I mean? Then you got the 1400 invasion, 1500, still Charles V, yada, yada, 16, 1700s, Shikamago Wars, 1776, their revolution, right? You still got the Shikamago, who are the Cherokees that are signing no treaties, making no deals with the hijack which are still the same, Sylvanus to Texas cons, Preston John cons, Davidic cons, Israelites, Hasharala, AD 880, Israel III, for liberating to Texas, he was banished. And so he, he, he saves Sylvanus to Texas and, and was banished. He was first to break the custom. The earth shook. Or, okay. The earth shook. Fear overwhelmed the hearts of men. In the third year after he had fled, they betook themselves into the city and kept themselves within their walls. A dead man thou shalt not bury nor burn in the city. So he liberated him by, you know, burying him or burning, you know, burying his body, like liberating his soul. But you're not supposed to do that in the city, so he banished him before the city a plane was extending. He was wrong the city. It was a hundred years since Jacob was king. Jacob stationed himself in the front line. He anticipated everything. <laughs> Shout out to Kalelu's bodies on bodies of Kalelu's. He fought much himself, often smote the enemy. Israel turned his attention to the appointment of priests. We have life of people widely ruling. 895, an unknown land. What that I might accomplish my task to serve the king. It is uncertain how long life will continue. There are many things which can be said while the war wages, rages. 3,000 were killed. The leader with his principal men are captured. Nothing but peace was sought. 
God ordains all things. And, you know, they don't know what the OL in scripture means. There's many theories on it. But Rhoda's right here. <laughs> and the Rodans, you know what I'm saying? The Rodriguez, the Rhode Islands, you know. So now they got Maine over there. They got Rhode Island over there. But Maine and Manhattan are right, right here. I gotta find the other map that has the Rhoda and the man in there right next to each other. You got the Toltec flow right here. Come on, cuz. It's all right here. It's all clear. This is pretty funny. It says 50 facts about the Tucson art artifacts. <laughs> Hmm. According to the then prevailing notion of personality, love to Kalalus.com and pull up these links. According to the then prevailing notion of the personality of the law, Jews, Britons, Gaul, Romans, and others were classified as Romans in Western Europe. Jews were classified as Romans. Now, you know, <laughs> they're stretching hard. They stretching hard if they want to connect, you know, these titles of today together. But if you connect the Jews to Judah and the Romans to the Riman or the Romani, then yes, we know that it's all one. The Britons, which just means covenant, you know, all this is one. So the Hebrews, you know, like David uh, Lowe tried to say, you know, the, the Jewish Roman colony no, is the Judah Romani. It's the Judah Romani. It's the Jews and the Romans, right? <laughs> Classified as Romans, while the Byzantine Greeks were still called Romans as well. Because these Byzantines connected to the Mosak, the founder, and the Mazaka flow that we got, right? This is all. Remember, the Byzantine Empire was taken out a year after the Papal Bull, too. So Hebrews are kicked out of Spain, 1452. Papal Bull Dumna versus 1452. 1453, the Byzantine Empire falls. Because you know these were Hebrew Nagas. These are Moses Nagas. Because they had their own Romani flow. So this Papal Bull Dumna versus hijacked the Nagas that were in Spain, First, they got, they got them out of there. The Hebrew Nagas, you know what I'm saying? The Judah Nagas and these Byzantine Nagas. They started cleaning the house right there. Then in 1492, Columbus finds us, right? Come on, man. It was war against the Hebrews from place to place. It was war against the kingdom of the Prester John. The Indias, Indios, in Hawaii. Man, okay. So they try to throw out like the the complaint against these artifacts, and then this author is giving his rebuttal, basically. So uh, they are old iron objects found outside Tucson in 1924. Incredibly, this fact, quote unquote, comes from the first sentence of the description of the Tucson artifacts in the Arizona Historical Society's catalog, which is published on the World Wide Web. The Tucson artifacts are made of lead. Lead, rusty ranch objects are found. Artifacts are excavated and housed and protected. So they're not iron, they're lead. Interesting. They are made of common typographers lead. On one of my visits to the historical, uh, sorry, uh, Arizona History Society, I read a whole dossier from their archives on how three merry cowboys cooked the whole hoax up in their kitchen stove to puzzle newspaper reporters. The Arizona Borough of Mines of, at the University of Arizona certified long ago that the lead of the Tucson artifacts matched that of the old Yuma mine about 12 miles away. 
Go see the movie 310 to Yuma, man. <laughs> huh? Okay. The letters and the drawings are engraved on the surface of the lead. No, they are reproduced from the wax from a waxing original by pre precision casting, also called the lost wax process. This technique has been known to virtually all metal using cultures around the world, except the University of Arizona Archaeological Department since about 3000 BC. All right. And they try to say this is Oliver. Come on. <laughs> they were made by a single mad forger or a small party of madmen. If you believe this, then you naturally hold a single forger, perhaps the same person responsible for the Michigan tablets, which consist of 10,000 to 30,000 objects with strange writings unearthed from mounds in every county of the lower peninsula of the state from 1852 to 1922 probably more by now so if you're saying that uh you know this one single forger yada 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 then yeah i guess it's just one forger for all these artifacts and the michigan is also the meshi or the moses khan 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 c's and g's are interchangeable in the hebrew room <sighs> get a couple more they were cleverly inserted horizontally into a place in a hard pan soil so the ground wouldn't look so disturbed and the fake objects wouldn't look buried we saw how they did it on a television documentary <laughs> they're not as old as they might appear to be i'm not sure how old the experts want them to be though i suspect the optimum time frame is post columbia that's what they want them to be after columbus so that they can say that you know they are recent hebrew coming from the from Columbus, and, <laughs> but I would say that they're exactly as old as they appear and are. They're written in bad Latin. All the Latin are cribbed from a handful of. Oh, actually, actually, it's pretty good. <laughs> okay. So it's not bad Latin. It's pretty good Latin. All right, man. I mean, you, you see what it is. It's just all the Latin words were cribbed from a handful of books like Gildiver, Gilders, Sleeves, Latin grammar that. Students had access to in the university library in 1925. This argument repeated by the ignorant and nauseam. Just Google the name Jason Calavito. It is like producing the murder weapon in court, but only a toy plastic version of it. And there is not even a suspect. Pitiful. All right, for the last one, we'll get fact number nine. The Hebrew is impossible. On the contrary, it provides perfect specimens of Masoretic Hebrew written during one of the celebrated golden ages of Jewish literature. So the Hebrew and his artifacts are quite good, showing that not only the authors, but also the audiences of the inscriptions were highly educated and literate. These were highly educated knights writing this Hebrew on these you know, centuries old artifacts found right here in Rhoda, right here in Tucson, right here in Arizona. You know, pull up this link, man. We're just talking the Tucson artifacts. Dig on this book by Cyclone Covey called A Roman Jewish Colony in America. We've been digging on it, dropping that drop. Uh, you know, on the TDR radio flow. We back, man. Uh, sh this Shabbat coming up, we're just going to have a flow going for y'all, man. And just, you know, just a little welcome back flow. And, you know, be in a nice restful vibration while we do it. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, just look out for some updates on the site. This strong as well as we make our way back to the home base and getting our site. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> spectacular like none other you know now that we got you know our uh, t's crossed and i's dotted and other things you know what i'm saying we can come back to the home base and just make it everything that we want it to be it's supposed to be as a learning center cultural center for the nagas for nagaville you know what i'm saying so just look out for all the updates at 432 the drop.com and a hop to my it nagas <laughs> behind the scenes and a 
specifically my con cams, man. He was, you know, really um, helping helping the Naga in real time with a framework, uh, IT, uh, you know, just a, a blueprint, my Naga, just to make sure that this information never gets lost again, man. So the water to the con cams, man. Yeah, Kalelus. I mean, they're writing books about America, my Naga. They're writing books about the promised land. But do we know about it? The book unravels the story behind the Tucson Lead Crosses, presenting an honest and thorough assessment of the discovery. While some academics continue to challenge its authenticity, the evidence speaks for itself. This extraordinary publication sheds light on a remarkable chapter in history, challenging conventional narratives. Acquire this exceptional edition backed by solid research, not no play play, and embark on a journey that challenges established beliefs and explores the untold narratives of our past. Man, we're talking right here in America. We're talking Rome. <laughs> What's another name for Rome? Oh, the, <clears throat> the city of the seven or the Septimania. Oh, we're talking seven cities of gold. Why is there so many Romes in America? You know, there's more Romes in America than anywhere else, man. Look at all the Romes. New York, Mississippi, Missouri, Maine, Kentucky, Kansas. Ohio got like four Romes. Oregon, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Tunisia. <laughs> Dang, Wisconsin got a scout, man. Jefferson City, man. Indiana. Ain't that where they was hijacking? Ain't that Rome, Indiana? Ain't that where they came? They started walking around. These hijacks came over here, boss. They started, they started walking around this mountain of harmonics. It's Muhammad, Morocco, Managa, this is 1785, in the heart of the Shikamago War, Tecumseh War, Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> yeah, boss, they set up shop with this, the, the, the Moore Science Temple at Pembroke. Small African American town, and yeah, they had the formula for the holy mountain contained in the odd dimensions of the so called cube built by Ishmael and Abraham. They had the formula and they put it right here in the heart ball of America, and they started migrating or invading with their harmonics, and they caused a little ice age. They froze over Antarctica. There's glaciation lines everywhere, boss. Because these little dots you see is the limit of the glaciation. That means there's glaciers and moraines, rocks and soil deposited by retreating glaciers, boss. And this is the path and direction, annual migration of the Ishmaelites as they migrate in Indiana, Illinois, set up their Mecca, What happened to Kalelos? What happened to our promised land? Why are you setting up shop in Indiana, boss? Rome, Indiana. Rome City, Indiana. Illinois got a Rome. Georgia got a Rome. Alabama or all Abba. Ama, El Aba Ama, All Aba Ama. <laughs> Rome, my nugget. Rome, my nugget. Rome, my nugget. Yeah. Oh, we're just talking Rima. Rome or Rome. 
pomegranate or pomegranata for the pomegranatus. And the pomegranate leads you to the crown, the calyx. <laughs> And Ramad is one of the uttermost cities of Judah, God of, afterwards given to Simeon. So Joshua got a Ramad flow. It's all throughout the flow. The Ramad is everywhere. The Ru, Rumanemi, Rumami. And the Nehemiah flow got a Ramad flow. I'm just, you know, scamming what y'all got it to distinguish it from other Ramans <laughs> and uses it as a conjunction with Giba to describe the, lat the latitudinal span of the kingdom of Judah. So the Raman and Judah go hand in hand because the Raman is the uttermost city of Judah. So when they, when they hijack it and they turn it into Roman, I don't want to see his face <laughs> when they turn into Roman balls. No, come back here, Charles. Get over here, balls. You took our Ramon, our Ramani. You took our promised land. You want to take the seven cities of gold? He's the one giving Esteban the charge to take the Ramon. He's the holy Ramon. He's the holy crown, right? Because the Ramon is the crown. Now Charles got the crown. Black as King Charles, isn't it? Black as in curse, my liar. Black as in wicked. Hybor, <laughs> the hyber is the copper. How long have we been staring at this map off the balcony, right, cousin? We're not really connecting the hyber with the kyber with the kyber. You know, they got the the kyber crystal and the lightsabers and the Jedi and the Judah, but. We knew it was something special about you. We we knew you weren't just no game. We knew you weren't just no gamer, map. Now that we're connecting the Asgard flow in real time on the German maps. You got Samaria right here. All this is in, you know, <laughs> so-called North America. You got South America here where the Amazonia is, where the Peru would be. Amazonian jungle. So then you got the Kushik Sea. So it's letting us know this Kush flow is happening right here because they put Kush right here. And when you start digging on these kingdoms of Kush, it starts to get, you know what I mean? That's a whole nother puzzle because in some ways they got Kush in the Hamite genealogies, but a lot of the players in Kush and, and Shem seem to be duplicating each other like there ain't no really separation between the Kush and the Shem flow which is why Moses was the king of Kush for 40 years remember he wouldn't be just Kush of, you know what I mean of the Hamites right I think it still has something to do with Shem this Kush flow because it's right over here at Shem the Kushik Sea Kishan, Kishan, okay. Right. You go to Africa. I mean, you got Punt, Zimbabwe all over here. You go to Africa, right? <laughs> you ain't got nothing you've seen <laughs> of what you think will be in Africa. I'm just saying. It's, it could be something, could be nothing, but this is Vindia, boss. This is 
the Vendian Desert or the Indian Desert, my life. Ancient lands, man. Yeah. Shambhala. Okay. This is the Mediterranean flow. Asia flow. Kitai. Kitai. Like the car of Kitai. In the spot called Chosen, my night. <laughs> now, this is all pretty cool, man. Hey. The Hyboria is the Kyboria. The Hyber is the Kyber. What did we get last time? Open Secret of India. Shout out to Jay Madlock. Yeah. The copper and gold, the Afghan Khyber, right? You can drop the K, one letter rule becomes the Heber or the Hyper. Hyborian <laughs> is the Eber, Heber, Kiber, Egyptian Capri, Greek Kaf, Kafira, Kabera, uh, Kipria. Kipri, Kipri, Biblical Capernia, Arabic Kabar. We got a lot on this Kabar last time, the Arizona Old Dom Baba Covera. We got a lot of this Covera flow on the map on the David Rumsey map. Go get the last drop. Press the 139. <laughs> right on time. So, Kuberi, even the Kowa, Kowa, Hawala. Back to the Hawa or Hewi, Hawa. Grand Covera, man. Then you got the Irish Hibernia. That's when I was like, what? That sound like Hibernia. <laughs> but it also sound like what my con two tick was just dropping. And the map drop. Go get the Discord. Yeah, we talking Rota, but we talking, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of things. But we talking hyper Hyperborea. So you'll see this on a lot of the the uh, you know flat flat drop maps, you know, or the you know Gleason maps, you know. A lot of these maps got this centerpiece, right? As if you can go all the way to the center of the flow. No problem. And as you get into these gateways, like even on the David Rumsey map, let's pull that back. So we can get some orientation. We got Prester outside the wall. What is in the center? High boring. Hyper boring. <laughs> Hyper is the Kyber. Copper is the Hebrew. Hebrew. What is this in the center? What they would call as a muzzle equidestant AE flat earth map projection. This would be what they're calling the hyperborea flow. Wow. Let's get it a little clear. Because this is the year of the dragon, my mind. We see clearly. Mardell, Lord Glacio. Glaciers, I don't know. Greenland. So look how close we actually really are, you know. I mean, for real, for real. And I believe Admiral Byrne said it was pretty warm. You know, some areas up in this Arctic as well. So you, know, you got North America, right? Now, this is where they'll put Greenland. Greenlandia, Greenlandia. So, although it doesn't quite connect here, 
We got the Gestalt map 1548 showing India superior in its connection between what they'll call North America today and Greenland. Look how it just connects right off Florida, just ride the wave <laughs> of Greenlandy, right? And you ride that, you ain't crossing the Atlantic, Monaco, you are on land, right? And you can go right into Germany, <laughs> right into, you know, Britain and Scotland, right? Ireland. So all this is connected. These are the same Nagas. How, how can these not be the same Nagas? This is the same land. How can it not be the same land if it's connected? Same way North America connects to South America, Mexico. It's the same land. And this is the same land, but they hide this connection. So you think it's a whole other continent. They just brought you here. It's big enough from here, man. <laughs> Alas, that day is great so that there's none like it, but it is a time of trouble unto Jacob. But out of it shall he be saved, and it shall come to pass in that day, says Hawaii of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off your neck and will burst your bands, and strangers shall no more make him their bondman, but they shall serve Hawaii, their power, and David, their God, whom I will raise up unto them. Okay, let's go. Just had to remember what we, what we was doing this for, my life. So don't be dismayed, Asherah, for Allah will save. I want to talk my cons for all your encouragement, all your comments. Just right quick, just giving that a hop. Two tick Rick, always there, man. Uh, to be authentic is to be in spirit or inspired. Don't be a chameleon, a snake. Be a fierce fire breathing draca. A hop to the con, two tick Rick. A hop, Monica. Uh, my own, you know, I'm say I'm gonna say Monica. <laughs> X I A I X U N N man. I said remember Anatoly for the man. <laughs> One thousand or twelve hundred years difference. Hmm. I think the maps in the fifteen hundreds are from the five hundreds. There are studies that show that the one in front of the five hundred is actually an I. As soon as I run across it, I'll make sure the drop falls. M H O A shot to X. You and, and, and that's what we're talking about. That's what we're about to jump into right now. Some of this for the echo drop, medieval history of the M, uh, Israelites, Robert Grisham drop, and we'll get on to <laughs> what I've been trying to get to for a while, which is chapter one <laughs> of Lost Tries and Promised Lands. You know, we always belly flop, but I think there's some drop in chapter one, too. I just want to establish the flow since we know the Preston flow is all through that. Uh, shout out to Drop. Shout out to the drop. Happy Shabbat. Thanks to all you for all you do, bro. Your work is appreciated. M-H-O-E-K-T-C. Shout out to you. Truth be told. And you're appreciated, my cause. Hey, I have to stay the course. What it do? Hey, I have IPO. What it do? I said I grew up near Magu Rock. That passage in that weird sand dune. You know, kind of by Neptune's net. Hmm. Always seemed like something had just happened there. Like, this is what it looked like now compared to before. But I don't know. Before, both locations are in the background of innumerable scenes and movies, video. And we in that press, the job 139, man. <laughs> hey, I'm IPO, man. <laughs> man, Ellsford Honor, man, what it do? Uh, boss. <laughs> You know, we're talking about that boss. Boss? What about William Morris, who visited the ice wall? Okay. And was stuck in the gate and made it out to tell. I remember that drop. It's like the modern ninjas <laughs> ain't got balls for adventure. One day, I wish to visit the serpent gate. Say what y'all want. Big balls, ninja. 
Hey, pop off, car. In that 139. Um, yeah. And, you know, I wonder what that, how that connects with the Hollywood. Uh, William Morris, there's a William Morris talent agency. You know what I mean? Is that the same William Morris that visited the ice wall? Hmm. Yeah, I'm Ellsford, man. Oh, man. You got that tree drop, how they got the electricity coming out the trees. I know that a tree shocked me before. It was a tiny one at the park. <laughs> I do not need a machine to tell me. So, shout out to Fasadine. Uh, man. Peace. Check out Marco Polo. Yeah, man. The old man and Hashashin. I remember that episode about the old man. And they called him the Preston. Cerebro, what it do? Shout out to John Meek, what it do? Also, Long Island Oyster Bay, indigenous tribes, Meroki tribes, Merari, priesthood, carried the Ark of the Covenant, they chiefs, and the indigenous tribes of Long Island. Old York, before new, was called Sashems. First Kings chapter 12, verse 1, the ten North, northern kingdom tribes, this brother done ex exceptional scholar research, give the brother his due, all these things will be brought to the true like hey con up to the con man drop you ain't over dropping oh, i appreciate that land of freedom man. i asked somebody to tell me that i ain't over dropping and shout out charles johnson the more you know the more you grow hey tiffany what it do she said i tried your discord link it's not working so i put a, a new invite link on there and on the uh in, in the description there and you'll see the same one in this video as well man so hopefully y'all got no problem getting in the discord because it's all happening man i just appreciate all your comments man just you telling me to keep it flowing man and cortez man what to do marcus mitchell uh gaba gaba uh mhoe this one be on repeat all the bs my daughter's dad my daughter's dad be putting i feel all along in this fight but yeah that all that matters is I knew I wasn't wrong. We ain't for sale. Hey, man. It ain't for sale, man. Our women ain't for sale. Our spirit ain't for sale. We ain't for sale. <laughs> we are not their bond, man. We are not their slaves, man. Hey, I'm Dizzle Fitty, man. Cat the King. Cat Con Con. What he do? All the cons, man. You know, I just want to give appreciation to y'all, man, at all times, man. Let's get, uh, some of this for the man go like the con said a hundred or a thousand to twelve hundred years difference, right? So we got a little bit of that before. Medieval Empire of the Israelites by Robert Grisham. Let's belly flop on uh let's check it here. Page fifty three. Okay. Oh, we belly flop to the Flavius. Now, this is going to get interesting, y'all, because we didn't talk Rome, right? We talked Rome for a reason. <laughs> we talked to Roman Raman for a reason. Let's go. Besides the duplication of the very same heroes under various names, gigantic shifts in time of the events described have been detected. Among the most significant examples are the numerous coincidences of the numerical characteristics of the biographies of the Egyptian pharaohs and the emperors of the Holy Roman of the Holy Roman Empire. So this author here, Robert Grisham, is making comparisons based on the Anatoly Fedomenko Russian uh, chronographer, you know, research, you know what I'm saying? And you know, just standing on his chronography, man. You know, using mathematical, numerical, astrological details and data that, you know. You can research Anatoly Fomenko, get all the drop, <laughs> but it's showing these parallels in the timeline. And the conclusion is that most of the real events that we think are antique or antiquity are nothing but duplicates and phantoms and reflections of what was happening after the 900s, after 900 A.D., and specifically, really, between this 1200, 1300 time period. And they just took that history and they put it back a thousand years, 300 years, 1800 years. They took the same king, changed his, his name, the same queen, changed her name 
a same hero, but change their name and put them in a different country or a different thing. Like, they did that. Scaliger and Batavius, they did that. So you don't know you're reading about the same person or the same people. So you don't know the connection between Judea and Romani or the Roman or Rome. You don't know that Judah is Rome. Because it's the Romani, it's the pomegranate, it's the promised land, it's Kalelus. It's Udall, right? And there's a connection with these Egyptian pharaohs, especially these Hyksos. <laughs> Hebrews that are ruling in Egypt, such as Joseph. Shepherd kings, right? So among the most significant examples are the numerous coincidences of the numerical characteristics of the biographies of the Egyptian pharaohs and the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. They analyzed on the computer the writings of the Roman historian Josephus Flavius, one of the classic sources, the works of whom describe solid periods of history both of Israel and of ancient Rome. With what result? The implacable computer show that it is simply a retelling of the Old Testament with the manipulation of names and ge geographical events. Now, so Robert Grisham will give his interpretation of the data. We can have our own interpretation of the data. His interpretation is that the only difference is that the Old Testament is talking about the Judaic kings and Flavius is writing about the Roman emperors. Let me back it up. So he's saying it's a retelling of the Old Testament with the manipulation of names. So a retelling of the Old Testament is meaning that the Old Testament is the source word and it's being retold with the names being manipulated into the Roman events. But look how Robert Grisham make, puts his conjecture and flips it and says, in other words, the Old Testament was borrowed from Flavius. That's not what the dad is saying. You just said that it's, a, it's simply a retelling of the Old Testament with manipulation of names and geographical events. That means you're retelling the source or the Tanakh, my life. It's not the Old Testament borrowing from Flavius. It's Flavius borrowing from the Old Testament and his Roman, you know what I'm saying, uh, layout of history. The only difference is that the Old Testament is talking about Judah, right? Judea kings, and Flavius is writing about Romans or Romani emperors. This doesn't change the fact of the matter that biographies coincide. The cardinal conclusions made by Fomenko and his colleagues have been met with furious criticism. Traditional historians reject them both as a whole and in part. <laughs> Traditional historians. However, there still are yet to appear arguments in any critical article capable of refuting the mathematical and astronomical part of the works of the new chronologies. It is useless to argue with mathematics. This being the case, the rejections reduced to, quote, it cannot be that so many learned men of the past were so mistaken, end quote, or we must not deprive mankind of its history, end quote. And there are methods somewhere which refute Flamenco, end quote. <laughs> it is worth dwelling especially on the final argument, the question of methods developed both comparatively long ago and altogether recently, both times receiving widespread publicity. This has been the case in particular with respect to archaeological dating of sources and monuments. <clears throat> Shalaks, let's get it for this man. <laughs> For example, in Egypt of the 1819 dynasties, Greek vessels of the Mycenaean or Mycenaean culture 
are discovered in graves. For this reason, they are considered by archaeologists to have been contemporary with each other. It is not possible to regard them in any other way. Later, they find these same or closely similar vessels along with a special type of fasteners used in the Mycenae in Germany alongside urns. A similar urn was found near Fanger, and in this urn is also found a new type of pen. A similar pen is found in Sweden in the borough of, in the borough of King Bjorn. As a result, the burial mound was dated to the time of the 18th, 19th Egyptian dynasty. But at the same time, it was discovered that Bjorn's burial mound could no way be correlated with the king of the Vikings, Bjorn. It had to have been constructed a good 2,000 years earlier. It is not clear here what to understand from such similarity of discoveries. Some may say that the objects are similar, but others will deny this. And he who is closer to the truth will not win the argument, but he who has the weightier authority in the scientific world, that is, the procedure, will rest on undivided subjectivism and successful appeal to previously established authorities. Can one honestly call this scientific? In our opinion, no, especially since, again, the objects found are being compared with similar discoveries dated earlier in order to accord with the Scaligarian tradition. <sighs> Scaliger and Patavius done change times and laws. Added to the timeline. Push time back. Listen up, the excavations of Pompeii are a striking example of the problems which arise in the dating of archaeological material. The 15th century Jacopo Sanazzaro wrote, We are approaching the city Pompeii and its towers, homes, theaters, temples, untouched by the centuries, already were visible. This is 15th century. But Pompeii is considered destroyed and covered by the eruption of 79 A.D. How is this author writing of Pompeii Monaga in the 1400s? <laughs> if it was already destroyed in 79 AD, make it make sense. I'll wait. What would you say, boss? Somebody added over a thousand years to the timeline. Sometimes 1,800 years, right? It is too much to explain anything. Archaeologists are forced to assess Sanazaro's words. Thus, quote, in the 15th century, some of Pompeii's buildings already stood out higher than the alluvium. And some they include, as we see, both towers, homes, theaters, temples, and the word, the whole city. A fantastic picture is being formed. The thing is that there was never one case when ancient settlements buried beneath the earth would have appeared over time on the surface and then once more have gone beneath the alluvium. Such cannot be, but they reasoned so about Pompeii, the remains of which were stumbled across only in 1748 in particular. Otherwise, it would be necessary to change all dating. Excavations of Pompeii itself were performed barbarously. Archaeologists, ar archaeologists write, quote, now it is difficult to determine the magnitude of the harm which resulted from the vandalism of that time. If a picture didn't seem beautiful to someone, they broke it into pieces and threw it away as rubbish. When they discovered some kind of marble table with a bronze inscription, they tore off individual letters and threw them into a basket. They fabricated souvenirs for tours from fragments of sculptures not infrequently with the pictures of saints. It is not ruled out that some of those supposed forgeries may have been originals, but only those who were allowed to survive intact, which would fit into the Scaligarian chronology. You know, so it goes into the Sphinx and some other Egyptian flows. Let's get it back. Let's get it back for a stack. <laughs> the 
picture that emerges from this as discovered by the scientists and his followers is that practically all of the story which is attributed to dates earlier than 900 AD Monaga consists of duplicates all of the story all of history that they're giving us in this BC's in this JC situation happened after 900s which means that the real JC <laughs> or the real Joshua Yeshua is what's happening at that Quetzalcoatl 1000 AD mark and they're actually going to put it in 1054 so if you got Joshua that's rocking with Moses popping off at 1054 AD you don't got no space in your timeline for no Jesus story who died 28 AD they had to add a thousand years for that if all the real drop biblical and otherwise is happening after 900 that brings you right into the Anasazi migration Toltecs Sylvanus Toltecs 775 Kalelus Emperor of America, Promised Land, Pomegranate, Pomegranata. And you, my Pomegranaga Nagas, <laughs> are the truth, man. Are the chosen that are just found right here and invaded over and over again. But Nagas that look just like us, Columbus and them, Charles and them, Swarthy Charles, Swarthy Germans, <laughs> France, British, Italy, Italy. And they're marching around their cube, freezing the land over, and we still fighting against them in 1700. Anatoly von Mankel performed a simple at first glance investigation if one takes the biography of any person and writes down the dates of the primary events of his life, taking the date of birth at zero, then a definite series of dates will result. Let's assume zero equals birth, 12, serious illness, 22, marriage, 27, a war, 29, birth of a son and heir, and so on. The resulting series has an interesting property of specificity provided that one has a rather large number of dates, the probability of the concurrence of any two individual biographies is practically nil. It is not possible, my life, that all these occurrences are happening at the same damn time. I mean, one occurrence is crazy, but if all of them are lining up, then you're going to have to start putting these histories uh, parallel, right? What then was the result when they entered the dynastic data of many royal families, both of Europe and Asia, into the computer, the results were stunning. The biographies co coincided when it was a question of rulers. They lived earlier, or who lived earlier than the 17th century. After the 17th century, there was no coincidence. So after the 1600s, things were smooth, right? No parallels or no duplicates. Before the 1600s, lots of duplications. But most of those are starting, you know what I'm saying, in this after 900 period and being pushed back 300 years. They changed the king, changed the name, changed the title, but it's the same Nag, it's the same hero. Say no play play. So when we talk wrong, <laughs> we talk Judah, we're talking about the same damn thing. Yeah, boss. Anatoly Flamenco also showed that in many chronicles, the year 1054 AD, the so called fundamental shift of 1053 years. And the chronology is implied as year one, boss. 
So 1054 AD, according to Anatoly Fomenko, is the year one. Which shows that there was a shift of 1,053 years. And that's when they created JC. Why not put them in 1054? Because you got Quetzalcoatl. The Mormons know this. They call Quetzalcoatl JC, Jesus. They call Quetzalcoatl Jesus in the Mormon flow. Latter day Saints. They know Quetzalcoatl is a Joshua Mashiach. Brought you to the promised land. But you don't go through Joshua to get to the creator. Joshua was sent by the creator. Just like your prophets. Just like the priest, the shepherd. Dawi. This means that the medieval chronicles often dated the birth of Christ precisely to 1054. But if Christ just means anointed, then what anointed was born in 1054? <clears throat> and all this connects and they connect the eclipses you know like astronomical events uh, so what was then discovered it turned out such a pair of rarest astronomical events the flare up of a new star 31 years later a full solar eclipse in the Mediterranean really did take place but only in the 11th century age D. This is the well-known flare-up of the new star in 1054 and the full solar eclipse of the 16th of February, 1086. The shadow of the solar eclipse passed through Italy and the Byzantine. And that's what they took out one year after the Papal Bull, right? Come. So much drama now, you know, especially dealing with chronology to dig on. Let's uh, hit up one more spot I want to dig on here in the medieval empire of the Israelites. <laughs> Hope you're having fun digging on this truck. Hope you're enjoying the flow. Oh, we got some hyperborean try, okay. Mm. Sumerian time. We saw Sumeria on the hyper hyborian map. So we're still talking Scaligarian chronology. Really enjoying some of this connection popping off. As soon as the generally accepted chronology is accepted, lapses appear instantly, nomadic epochs, exactly like the Dark Ages in Europe. If the Scythian Sarmatian, remember Sarmatia also connects with the Amazon is viewed as having been filled with corresponding monuments rather evenly than beginning with the end of the 4th century AD. Numerous burials of nomads in the Black Sea area suddenly disappear. Later on, from approximately the turn of the 9th to 10th century, they just as suddenly appear again and in considerable numbers, they continue to exist in multitudes all the way up to the middle of the 14th century. After this, they disappear again forever. This, with the formal spread across the reference of nomadic uh, antiquities, according to the general accepted chronological scheme, two large temporal breaks are formed. We're talking timeline. One of them, the 5th to 9th centuries inclusive, correlates with the epic of the great migration of people we talk in Exodus. It is thoroughly highlighted in the written sources up until then. The impression is created that the steep was overcrowded with nomadic hordes, 
We're talking mongols. <laughs> if one is to believe the ancient authors who are writing much about the tribes of the Black Sea area, these are all Nagas. All these are Nagas. All these, a lot of them are Israel, man. Sumerians, right? Scythians, right? Scotia. Agathirs. Galans, Myats, Isodonis, Uzi, Hans, right now, he's the Mongol. The Khazar flow, or we're talking Mazaka, which was changed to Khazar, which is where they're getting the Tsar title. The Tsar is like their Khan or chief title. Tavri, Scythian Tavri, Hyperboreans, or Khyber, or Eber, Heber. <laughs> all right, Gala, Kumar, all these titles, man, all right. Okay, so we're connecting the Byzantine flow at the same damn time. Remember the islands? <laughs> As we were in Genie, searching for uh, you know, Genie.com on this Presta John flow, they kept breaking us to the Ascetians, the islands, and again, the Sarmatians, all connecting with the Amazon flow. And even they called uh, Presta John the king of the islands, Alania. Let's go. Belly flopping. Okay. Belly flopping, man. Just digging on it. Digging on it with y'all. Y'all see some drop, man. Y'all let me know, man. You know, I'm always digging, man. Especially when I see Ixos, man. <laughs> What's the Ixos got to do with Central Asia and the Asiatics? So I've been dropped this $1,000 book on my knockers, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Ben dropped the PDFs, man, so you got it. But, you know, we have yet to read all this cover to cover. But, you know, they go into all this. Got to get it from here. We're still talking Black Sea. Okay, the questions, as you see, are pointed. And the adherents of Scalinger history had either to reject previous views or contrive some kind of version which explained the new facts and they contrived one quote the influence of the hittite culture was significantly powerful to manifest itself across a great distance long after the state and the people that created it had passed into eternity as we see not only the hyksos but also the hittites rendered an influence on on the descendants both for a thousand or for two thousand years there was no reason to say that such a version does not invite criticism, but let us return to the Hyksos. They have one distinguishing feature besides being shepherd kings. They are on horsebacks. In one of the books on Egypt, we find the Egyptians, of course, had no reason to thank the Asiatic newcomers, but nevertheless, they gave Egypt a valuable gift. They brought horses there. Until their arrival, this king of domestic animals was not known in the Nile Valley. There are as many donkeys portrayed on the monuments as you like that were used for all sorts of agricultural jobs, but of horses, not one. The horse soon was established and began to be bred. That's from Z. Rogozina. Everything is correct. The newcomers traveled on horses and arrived, arriving in Egypt and Asia Minor, right? Because this is Asia Major. Khan established there the culture of horse breed. But when it happened and whether, when it happened and whether they were Asiatics, we will look into a bit later. Right now, 
about the nomads and the history of ancient Rome. Here, they also prove themselves to be awful evildoers. Their raids have been described with, with details that freeze the soul. The most gentle epithets of the ancient and Byzantine authors for the nomads, fierce, wild, Danube wolves. They reach the race, real men of Mars, right? Mm. Then Benjamin Franklin, you know, big up the inhabitants of Mars, <laughs> something like, and the gods of Mars. Swords always at the ready, because God of War, right? Reports and alarmed OV as early as 16 AD, the Sarmatians Samar crossed the Danube in masses. Rome succeeds in dealing with them only with great difficulty. The Sarmatians invade in jolts, as it were, in 35 to 37, 49 to 50, 68 to 70, and 80 to 92, the emperor Domitian wages exhausting war with the Sarmatians, Sarmatians and Dacia. Roman authorities try first to defeat the individual Sarmatian tribes one at a time, then to pay off their leaders or to tame them with money, gifts, honors. See, these were the Amazon queens, man. They tried to tame them. They settled the Sarmatians on empire territory as a defense against the next invasions by the next nomads from the east. Broadly speaking, this is the situation on the lower Danube in the first century. And the Forbidden Histories of America also connect with this Dan, this Danube situation. So it's a whole lot of drama around these shepherd caves, my life. Interesting, right? But they always had this Jerusalem in the center. Same way they got the Hyperborea in the center now. Right? They knew it was in the center. So what's the difference between Hyperborea in the center and Jerusalem in the center? We're just talking to Eber, man. All these are hijacked paintings. Because we see the originals. <laughs> Copper color knives. And they're bringing up the Kush knives again. And how they connect to the Israel flow. Like I'm saying, there's a connection. Between the Ethiopia, Abyssinia, and the Kush flow. The Qumram and the Qum knives. I'm going fast, but you got the drive, man. You know, you got the you got the full drive. Go kick back and dig on it. <laughs> and put your investigation together, right? All we can do is ask the right questions. We talking car it's <laughs> I love belly flopping, man, <laughs> especially in a book like this. Was this comparing Rome and China? Okay. Johnny the Baptist. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, Johnny. Says there are other parallels just as surprising and striking, especially regarding the Son of Heaven, i.e. Christ, in which connection Chinese legend gives in our opinion a more accurate dating of his appearance in history the 11th century A.D. According to the dating and adherence of the new chronology, the activity of John the Baptist and afterwards J.C. occurred in the 11th century. Preston John letters written in 1165. We keep saying who was who, who Preston John baptizing in the fountain of youth. Man, this ain't no Christian <laughs> baptism. This is living waters baptism. An indication of these events is preserved in the Chronicles, the Kari, Karakata, Preston John. Accepted baptism 1009. At approximately the same time, the Turkic speaking Angut accepted Christianity. The Oguz and other parts of the Kigil were baptized, even among the Kidan themselves and the tribes of the Western Manchuria who were subordinate to them, some Christian element. Now, they're still looking for the tribes of Preston John. They ain't baptizing nobody. They're just talking about the legend of Preston John. They're talking about the founding of youth, Monogamy. We found that gave rise to the appearance in medieval Europe of the legend of Preston John. Most likely, this is a reflection of John the Baptist. Or John the Baptist is a reflection. <laughs> he always puts stuff backwards, you know, <laughs> of Preston John. You know, the, the Flavius copy the Old Testament, or the Old Testament copy from Flavius. Hmm. Did they create the legend of Preston John based on John the Baptist in the in the uh, you know New Testament, my name? or you know is that a reflection of the priest Con David already popping up? Especially since the beginning of the 11th century, John Crescentius appears in Roman history. So there's another John who was one of the reflections of John the Baptist. So how many? Whoa. So if we look up John Christensius in the Roman history, we could get a hard hit for some of this Preston flow. Hmm. So all this J.C. Christa stuff happened way later, over a thousand years later. And it all connects back to the legend. <laughs> Of Preston John, including John the Baptist, man. Who, oh, who <laughs> is Preston John? Like I said, for the dismount, we'll get a little bit of this chapter one here, man. It lost tribes and promised land. But Ronald Sanders. I hope y'all enjoying surfing the wave, man, and getting to 140. Is something that we can be proud of for a very long time. There's so many great chapters that we haven't even read, you know. <laughs> this might be a 150 part series. I don't know, man. <laughs> you know, by at least after 150, we know you, you're going to have to get this investigation exclusive <laughs> at 432thedrop.com, man. 432thedrop ready. We got a lot of this uh, prologue before. It's very interesting. Very interesting. You know, because they're talking about this Antichrist situation. Antichrist, he will be reared at Chorazin in Galilee. When he's 30 years old, he will begin to preach in Jerusalem. So it sounds, why is the Antichrist sound so similar to Jesus? This is, look, how could this man be anything but a savior? They're talking about the Catalan map with the one king that's standing on the Catalan map with the golden fruit in his hand. And their interpretation is that he must be the Antichrist. How can this man be anything but a savior? 
but there is nothing of the traditional imagery of Jesus about him. On the contrary, the inscription below the scene reads Antichrist. So the JC they gave us is really the anti anointing. Ooh. Because <laughs> yeah, this Antichrist is the one being reared in Galilee, 30 years old, beginnings to preach. Contrary to all truth, he would say he is Jesus Christ, son of the living God. And it is said that he will rebuild the temple. Stop it. Contrary to all truth, what does it mean? That means he's telling lies. He's telling lies. God, the legend of the lost tribes goes back to the divided kingdom of Hebrew antiquity. One of the traditional 12 tribes, 10 were in the northern Kingdom of Israel and two, Judah and Benjamin were in the southern kingdom of Judah. When the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of 722 BC, so called, right? They removed virtually its entire population and placed them in Hala and in Habor. Back to Second Kings, because Habor is also what? H A B O R is also what, God? H A B O R is also what? Cabal. Eber. Kyber. Iboria. Or the Hebrew. Heber is also the Habar or Kabar or Kavera. Cuba, Hibernia. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, Pops. Or perhaps even beyond on the Catalan map near the inscription about the Antichrist, but further out on the unknown ocean sea beyond Asia, it's yet another inscription that reads, Isaiah the prophet, I will send those that escape of them unto the nations in the sea, to Africa and Lindia, hmm? and to the islands far off. Man, now we're thinking about worlds beyond the poles. They have not heard of me. And have not seen my glory, and they will announce my glory to the nations. Man, with this vision of redemption in far off lands of lost tribes, perhaps the ten lost tribes, perhaps some other wandering remnant of the elect settling in new Canaan's kings or Anans. The Europeans had yet to discover this inscription, seems to be prophesying an age of discovery and of the Messiah all at once. Chapter one, right? <laughs> the idea of race was, for better or for worse, only a dim, sporadic and sporadic one. To most Europeans during the Middle Ages, its outlines did not begin growing distinct until the 14th and 15th centuries. But when the dawning finally occurred, it shone with particular fury upon the Iberian Peninsula, which discovered itself in the light to contain the most racially varied society in Western Europe. The results were soon to be revolutionary. Antagonism, which had before been almost purely religious, writes the historian Henry Charles Lee, became racial while religious antagonism became heightened in Spain, which through the earlier Middle Ages had been the most tolerant land in Christendom, became as far as the 15th century, or as the 15th century advanced, the most fanatically intolerant. 
for some two or three hundred years thereafter, a part of the history of the Iberian peoples was to be dominated by this development in the old world and then in the new, where they opened the way to still to a still more varied racial experience than they hitherto had known. They thus became the pioneers of our modern racial history of the West, just as surely as they became the pioneers of Europe, European overseas colonization. Indeed, after a brief prelude of racism in the old world alone, the two roles often went hand in hand. Until that dubious dawning, Spain had traditionally been, from the cultural standpoint, not so much a part of Europe as a separate subcontinent. Hmm. Subcontinent hanging midway between civilizations that had swept into it. Now from the north, now from the south, to form a unique ingathering of peoples and religions, even the primordial encounter between Celts and Iberians from which was distilled the first Spanish population. Spanish population. To enter the light of history had been a meeting of Europe and Africa, so also was the fully historic encounter that took place in the third century BCE between the Carthaginians who had succeeded to the hegemony established in the south of the peninsula centuries before their Phoenician forebears and the Roma, who had similarly succeeded to the early Greek preponderance in the north, like the First Punic War, which had pitted these two Mediterranean imperial powers against one another in Sicily, in some ways a smaller, insular counterpart to Iberia. The second, in effect, sought a decision as to whether the contested region was thenceforth to be European or African. This struggle and its outcome established a pattern that was to be repeated in the Middle Ages with the Arabs and the role of the Carthaginians. The Roman victory in the Second Punic War brought Spain into the orbit of Latin Europe, but not necessarily to the complete effacement of that other cultural st strain that had come up from Africa and ultimately traces origins to the Semitic East, not at least if we may judge from the persistence of place names like Cadiz, Cartagena, Barcelona, right? We just connected the Hebrews in Barcelona and the Forbidden Histories of America with the road of flow. So we got the drop with the Ramah and the road of flow. And the Ramani. May we not assume that at least a few of its deposits lingered in the collective memory as they did on the map. We know that elements of the medieval Arab, a rabbi, right? The Arab propers. They, let's go for the dismount. Cultural legacy has persisted in Spain to this day. So it is quite possible. But well, we know that's it. There's a big Moorish influence in Spain, right? Moorish or a big Hebrew influence in Spain. Huh? Arab proper is different than the Arab pretender. We are talking Ishmael, right? So it is quite possible that something similar happened with the ancient Carthaginian one in Ambivalence, or ambivalence, born of history, geography, and blood may well have continued to repose beneath the Romanized and Romanized, Romanized surface. But on that surface, at any rate, Spain was primarily and often zealously Latin for the next nine hundred years. Even after the Roman hegemony, they are divided, or excuse me, yielded to the Germanic. Swarthy. In the 5th century, one of the greatest Latin authors of the early Middle Ages, Isidore Seville, flourished in the 7th century under the Visigothic monarchy. Finally, in 711, 
the apparent Roman Christian Adil, I-D-Y-L-L, was violated by another tidal wave from Africa, carrying another legacy from the Semitic East. This time, a militant Islam, which swept up through most of the peninsula and pushed back the remnants of the Visigothic rule, nearly into the Bay of Biscay. There is the rough Cantabrian Northwest, the forces of the future Reconquista gathered strength for what would ultimately be another Latin triumph over this revival of the ancient onslaught from the south. But it was time to take the Spanish Christians' desultory crusaders at best for their next 300 years were not to be aroused to systematic reconquest until in the 11th to 12th centuries a new wave of invasions from Africa threatened to upset the balance of civilization that had by then become well established in Iberia. So all this from Africa a lot has to do with Morocco, Moab and then even then, the eruption of Reconquista that was thereby provoked had run its course by the middle of the 13th century, with part of the peninsula still in Moorish, Morocco, Moab, and then Psalms 83. And it's the kingdom of Granada, but we're talking Palma Granada. Palma Granada is promised land. So they had their duplicate Granada there, and we have the real Palma Granada right here. They have a duplicate, a duplicate Morocco there, but they also have a Morocco right here <laughs> in your face ball. They have a Rome there. They got a Rome right here in your face ball. Morocco right here, right? Illinois, Indiana. Kentucky, Tippecanoe, where the Battle of Tippecanoe took place that killed the brother of Tecumseh, the, the prophet. Where X marks the spot and they gonna build a big old Pyramid, holy mountain of harmonics, covering all these states. Right after you gave up Ohio in the Treaty of Fort Wayne, 30 million acres ceased, taken 30 million. And what they do with that? They gave it to Muhammad. They gave it to Morocco. They gave it to Mecca. They gave it to these migrating Ishmaelites. They these Indian treaties it went right to Ishmael in there, Moab in there, Morocco in there. How you have a Morocco here and a Morocco there? How you got Granada here, Granada there, Rome here, Rome there, right? Phantoms and duplications. So still in Moorish hands, the kingdom of Granada was not to be eliminated until 1492. Whoa, now this makes sense because this wasn't no Moorish kingdom. This was Pomegranada, Pomegranada kingdom. This was Israel Monaga that got eliminated in 1492. Over there and over here where Columbus sailed the ocean blue in the same year, 40 years after the Papal Bull 1452. Make it make sense, right? And the final resurgence of the Reconquista that had been stimulated in part by the new racial consciousness and that soon showed its imperialist undertones. Before and between these epochs of militancy, however, we can catch sight of a very different picture, which in contrast <clears throat> with a simple myth of Reconquista. Show, ain't that what they put down to say that these lands belong 
to Ferdinand and Isabella here shows a quantity of friendly interchange between Christian and Muslim. Really? And now and then a thorough culture as well as biological mingling? Really? Because we have a theory, boss, that there wasn't no Christian versus Muslim situation. That was a made up beef. The, the real situation is that they were working together to find the Hebrew God, to find the promised land, Nagas. That the Christians wanted to convert Hebrews to Christianity. The Islam, Muhammad and them, like he made Kish, Saul's dad, he gave him the task of converting his people, right? Benjamites. Israelites to Islam. So the Mohammedans wanted us converted to Islam, right? The Christians wanted us converted to Christianity. Nobody wants us to be Hebrews, which means one thing. <laughs> it's the enemy <laughs> of my enemy, yo, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's the enemy of my enemy, my friend. <laughs> These people working together. This is Confederacy talk. These ancient Christians and these ancient Muslims are the same damn people. Because they were so friendly in their interchange between Christian and Muslim. And now and then, a thorough cultural as well as biological mingling. So they interbred houses. Why? Because they were the same tribe. The Christian is not a tribe. Muslim is not a tribe. No matter what they're claiming, their tribe is their tribe. And these are the same tribes that are against your tribe. Psalms 83. Indeed, there are moments when Spain seemed ready to produce an unprecedented Latin Arabic synthesis. What? The Latin Arabic synthesis? We got this in a whole other document. This, they call it the, uh, man. Some type of term for Christian Muslims and Muslim Christians, but they, they were entertained, intertwined, right? A rich and unique Andalusian civilization. One can perceive this potentiality in various sectors of Spanish life in the early Middle Ages. So, yeah, there's Moorish flow all through Spain. And these same Latins... <laughs> We're supposed to be Christians, you know what I'm saying, are also rocking with this Islam flow, you know what I mean? Because really, all that is a front to go into this tribal war and take out the Hebrews, just like Pope Nicholas V issue in the 1452 Doom Diverses. It goes deep out. I'll just get it from here and then we'll probably pick it up here and just keep this first chapter alive and press to 141, man. Let's get it. It manifests itself, for example, in the person of the great 10th century caliph of Cordova, Abdir Rahman III, unlike most of his Muslim subjects who were primarily of North African Berber stock, Morocco. And the Berber comes from Barbar, which means swan, connected with the swan knights of Kalelus. This is another title distilling from us. They're not the Barbars. They're not the Berbers, man. <laughs> they're not the swan knights. They're not the Solomon, Sylvanus, Totexas, Khans. They're not the Totex. These are titles still. These, these are identity thieves. Apt here, Rahman III could look back upon family origins that were purely Arab as well as royal, but his blood was three quarters European as well. Come on, boss. Christian captive women from the north were favorites in the harem and the harems of Cordova, and not only the caliph's mother, but his father's brother as well had been of this stock of Gothic slaves. Huh. 
the caliph also was European in culture to some extent, above all in speech, for though Arabic was his language of formal occasions, he spoke a romance. Roman is romance. <laughs> and the real romance has to do with a hero. Love to the tip blog. <laughs> and the hero, my love, is the cop. The hero is Hawa, first and foremost. So he spoke a romance dialect in ev everyday conversation. So we're talking Latin, right? Every or another example of the potential Andalusian cultural synthesis, the dialect spoken by Abdir, Raman III, or variants of it was widespread in Moorish Spain. Not only among Mazarabs or Mazarab, sound like that must arrive, you know, <laughs> Spanish Christians living under Moorish rule, but also among Muslims, many of whom were at least partly of Christian descent and among Jews. This situation had its literary manifestations. Although Arabic poetry usually was written in the classical language, there were verse forms in more Spain by the 12th century that employed not only the Arabic vernacular but the romance as well or romance ones as well generally written down in Arabic characters the latter were used mainly in the refrains of certain types of Moorish travel dare poetry whose clearly intimate relationship with the emerging provincial poetry of the day Incidentally, it's a mystery yet to be fully understood by modern scholars. These refrains or karjahs are vivid moments in Latin Arabic synthesis. And it goes into an example, man. And we'll get much more coming back in this chapter one. I just want to, you know, bring us in right. So by the time we get over here, we pop off where we normally pop off at, you know, around this chapter three flow. Yeah, man, I just love belly flop. Because it's a chapter we haven't even got, the Guiana Trey. But let's just get this for the decimal, man. I'm just belly flopping. Talk about the Negro and the anti-Negro. <laughs> but he ought to have opened his eyes more to what perhaps would have been a wholly different experience of Negroes from the one he was familiar with. This, at any rate, was what was discovered some 400 years later by the greatest of Arab travelers, Ibn or Ben Batuta. When he went to West Africa, at first he was disgusted at the sight of a people he had known only as slaves behaving as masters in their own country. But in time, this was precisely what he learned to respect. Then he could write, quote, The Negroes possess some admirable qualities. They are seldom unjust and have a greater abhorrence of injustice than any other people. There is complete security in their country. Neither traveler nor inhabitant in it has anything to fear from robbers or men of violence. They do not confiscate the property of any white man who dies in their country, even if it be untold wealth. They say, man, keep your monies, man. We got enough. <laughs> On the contrary, they give it into the charge of some trustworthy person among the whites until the rightful heir takes possession of it. Ibn Batuta also admired the punctilious, punctilious observance of the Quran that he saw among them, for he was in Muslim country. Indeed, his visit had taken place not long after the reign of the great black Muslim king Mansa Musa of Mali. Hmm. The whole atmosphere seems redolent of a western Muslim version <laughs> of the rim of Prestige. 
<laughs> How many times have we uh, said, is this man Samusha, you know, a Moses flow, a David flow, a Preston flow, the, the richest man of all time? And then you go into this Preston John letter and investigation and this Naga guy the richest kingdom of all time. And I said, how can these two rich Nagas be coexisting like this unless we got the same Naga? And they said, man, Samusa was in Timbuktu, right? <laughs> Setting up libraries in gold. The Hyboria Hybor map got Timbuktu right here, you know, near South America. <laughs> but they're saying that this is redolent of a Western version of the realm of Preston John. And Muslim, according to my bro, let us find the truth. You just, et etymologically, it's just saying the people of a promise. So even when they put the Muslim title, they're just saying people of a promise. It's not synonymous with Islam. It's its own thing. It's to be of a promise, to be bound to a promise. So who are these people bound to a promise in the realm of Preston John? And what's this connection to this to this Naga king who's bound to a promise or promised land, right? But Ghania never was supposed to be a promised land either for Arab or for European. For the outsider, it was always rather a vast circumference rimmed by desert and by sea and out of it. Out of which highly valued, valued commodities came but within which was a darkness that was either unappealing, forbidding, or terrifying. Yeah, man. Okay. okay. We just talking Preston John. And that just seems to connect to who is migrating. Psalms 89 or Shalak Psalms 83. <laughs> I should get Psalms 89, man, because, you know, as we know, we're talking firstborn by. And, you know, I'll just get enough to let you know this, though. <laughs> that the covenant of the Creator is with David. Forever will I establish your seed, Dawi. This is why we're still digging on it. All these Davidic cons, Davidic priesthood, all this Kalelus is about the covenant. It's about the promised land. The covenant is with David, but you don't access David until you access Hawa. <laughs> the Christians got it backwards. Go through the Son and get to the Father. No, you go through the Father to get to the first born by who's the first born I have found David my servant with my holy oil have I anointed him says a while he is exalted one chosen out the people yeah you go through the father to get to the first born my God and the rock of my salvation, I will appoint him firstborn. Forever will I keep for him my mercy. He is the highest of the kings of the earth. Surely I will not be false unto David. His seed shall endure forever. But what happened? To the sea, what happened to these treasured ones? Well, we got out of code, and by doing that, these other <laughs> tribes that hate us, that hate the Creator, lifted up their head. They took crafty converse, they made crafty counsel, they do counsels to this day against your people, and they take counsel against your treasured ones. And they come, they say, come, let us cut them all from being the nation of Israel. So that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. 
They have consulted with one consent. Against you do they make a covenant. But Hawa's covenant is with David, but they make a covenant against Hawa, against Israel. Who? Edom. Who else? Ishmael. Whoa. The same Ishmael that's marching, that's migrating in 1785. That's doing the treaties of peace and friendship. That's slaying the Nagas of Cholula. They took 30 million acres and made their <laughs> uh, really, really they say 3 million nah 29 million 719,530 acres of Naga land to the settlers of Illinois and Indiana and they set up shop Ishmael Illinois and Indiana and they set up their cube and their mecca and they harmonics and cause glaciations man they hijacked America for real this migration 30 million acres Seventeen eighty five they started migrating. Well why is that? <laughs> Cause seventeen eighty six they got the Treaty of Marrakesh or Pieces in Friendship between the United States and Morocco. <laughs> the same Morocco that they're setting up. They do a treaty with the hijacked United States, and then they start invading, so-called migrating, 1785. Damn. Right on the head bone of the Kumse. America's been at war 93% of the time. That's what they say. Global research. You know. It's crazy, right? Seventeen eighty five. And, you know, it looks like they've been at war the whole damn time against the same people. The Negro. The black man. <laughs> Which we know is the Hebrew. Seventeen seventy. Now they can start their revolution. Now they can start their revolution. Seventeen eighty five, they migrated on the Chicamago that didn't want to make the treaties with the Barocco and the United States. Right. Seventeen seventy six is the birth of a nation. July fourth, seventeen seventy six is the death of our nation. Because their peace ain't your peace. And your shalom, your shalom ain't their peace. You know what I mean? 
the same war. The Kulam say he's fighting the same war that the prophet loses his life. The Kulam say his brother in the battle of Tippecanoe. So they come against the niggas that didn't want to make the treaty. Start slaying our prophets and priests. Tip a canoe right here. And set up shop. With the 30 million acres that they stole. Because the Ishikamago didn't want to make no deals. They're making the deals. The Ishikamago didn't want to make no deals. These Shikamago. Nah, man. These are the ones that went down fighting and made no deals with the hijack. So they named them Shikamago after some river of death. But their name is not Shikamagwa. They are the she. <laughs> the she, C-H-I. They are the Sha. Shout out to my Chicago knockers. They are the Almec God. The Sylvanus, the, the Soli, the Cholas. Who was Preston John? You see the Magi, the Dalai Lama. <laughs> God. The Ishikamago, named after the river of death, my night. Are the Nagas that separated from the greater body of the Cherokee during the American Revolutionary War. Because those other uh, hijacks wanted to make treaties with the hijack, wanted to make a treaty of peace and friendship with the United States. And Dragon Canoe said, hell no. <laughs> the Kumse said, hell no, man. They ain't taking nothing else. We ain't giving no more 30 million. We ain't gonna give them no more states. You just gave up Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Kentucky in there. They got Mountains of harmonics now. They're dancing over the graves of our ancestors with their cubes, with the Moorish science temple. And we're just talking about the Ishmaelites migrating. This ain't never felt more real than now, man, because it's all happening when you realize you are the people. You are the treasure one. They've held crafty converts against your people a while, have taken counsel against your treasure once a while, all because we chose to be the harlot. But now we have returned. Now we got the code in our heart bone forever. Forever. We don't want to be no harlot no more. We don't want to be no harlot no more. An adulteress. Loving other gods. Thou shalt sit solitary for me. For who? For the creator you're solitary. Many days you shall not play the harlot. You can't belong to nobody else. <laughs> For Israel shall sit solitary many days, man. You forgot about your king, queens, royalty. You don't know what I'm talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about the empire of Kalelus, man. Cholula. <laughs> Cibola, 
You've been in solitary, boss, many days. You, you're discombobulated. You lost your orientation. If you think you're some homeboy slave, you ain't the royal, my nigga. You ain't had your things, your sacrifices, your pillars, your ephahs, or your teraphim. But verse 5, Hosea 3, afterwards shall the children of Israel return. And this is exactly what you're doing today. This is exactly what it means to KTC. You don't seek Jesus to find God, man. You seek the creator. And then you can connect to Dawi. Then you can access this investigation, these Akashic records, this ether, right? Then you can surf this way. We don't need to combine a bunch of nonsense and information. We can just combine the vibration. Because we've been here the whole time, man. This is your 140th <laughs> installment of the Priest King Preston John Investigation. And you can get 140 parts on one flash drive. For still only 45, I still honor that with you, my noggin, before it goes up, before it doubles, my noggin, you know what I'm saying? Uh, these are very expensive to make and do and put together, so it's very time consuming, you know what I mean? And I want you to uh, have the drop, man, so get it for 45, and you'll get pressed in 1, 2, and 3, all 140 installments on a single flash drive for 45 you can hit our cash app. The details are in the description below. Uh, cash app 432 The Drop Radio. You're 45. And also email us um, at 432thedrop at gmail.com with your shipping. You'll get emails going out this strong. Just checking in with y'all. Let y'all know that, you know, orders, you know, have been recorded. And everything's going out to you. You know what I'm saying? So we appreciate you so much. And uh, this is for us. You know, this is our time capsule. This is our investigation. You can share with your grandparents, you know what I'm saying, your children. And you don't need the internet. You got your flash drive. And the one we're getting can plug into your laptop or your phone. So you got the drop, man. Only 45, 140 parts, man. 140 installments, man. Right in your face, boom. Hi, Bory. <laughs> yeah, we've been home the whole time. Welcome back, guys. Welcome back to the land of Shem. Where Egypt is, right? Right over here where Mansa Musa is, Timbuktu, where Kush, the real Kush is. Yeah, the Black Kingdom, the Amazon. The Golden Hills. <laughs> Hyperborea, Asgard, <laughs> and more worlds beyond the poles, man. The bottom of my cons for tuning in nine above the barrier, man. And keep it flowing. Get it back for a stack. You know what I'm saying? Ride to this, man. Ride to this wave. Sleep to it. Wake up to it. And know that it's, it's coming right from the heartland, right from the heart bone. The water and you know my nag is true a high man like we at 140 now at 141 true a high to y'all for getting all this drop and if you're brand new to surfing the wave i got one word for you man belly flop <laughs> stay up suit up choose up drop nation cool cool